So welcome everybody. Um, good afternoon to our viewers um, here in Germany and good morning to our viewers um, in the United States. Um, I'm Stormy Annika Miltner. I'm the director of the Aspen Institute Germany and I'm really delighted to welcome all of you to this uh, latest installment um, of our Road to Election series with the title From Convention Season to the Final Cam Cam Campaign Stretch. Um, where we will dive a little bit more deeply um, into the current state um, of the US presidential election. This event is hosted uh, by the Aspen Institute Germany, the uh, Transatlantic Hub and the German Alumni Association of uh, John Hopkins University SAIS. Um, and um, we want, as always, um, and as our partners always, also always want to do, this webinar as interactive and open as possible. So um, get ready to get engaged, um, post your questions um, in the um, uh, chat function, and we will pick them up um, later on during the conversation, and we'll make sure that we answer as many um, as possible of those uh, questions. Please also keep in mind, this is not a Chatham House event. Uh, this uh, event is going to be recorded um, and it is going to be shared on our social media channels afterwards. Um, and you can also access uh, it through YouTube. So tell all, uh, um, all of your friends uh, about this exciting event, which they might've missed, but they can watch up later on. And now without further ado, um, it's really my great pleasure to introduce um, my or one of my partners in crime, if I may say so, on the side of the Atlantic, uh, Tina Hofikov. Tina, it's such, uh, it's really wonderful um, that we are doing this event uh, together and that you are going to lead us through the day today. Um, you are the founder of the Transatlantic Hub and you describe yourself as dedicated transatlanticist. Um, and from knowing you for the last Oh, is it already two decades or even more <laughs> that you are really a true um, transatlanticist um, with one foot here in Germany and in the EU and with the other foot deeply rooted um, in the United States. Um, and I can't um, can't think of anybody um, else. I, I love working um, with more than you because you bring in not just your knowledge but also your passion for the transatlantic um, relationship um, and with this i hand over to you i uh, hand it over into your trustful hands and i wish all of us um, a lot of insights um, a lot of new knowledge and also a lot of fun so over to you tina well, thank you so much, Stormy. This is really nice of you and very kind words. Thank you so much. Um, it's always a great pleasure working with you together. And today, um, I'm really delighted that we could bring in such a great um, panel um, together with uh, Ambassador John Emerson and Daniel Hamilton. And this is a joint co-hosted event, as you said, with Aspen Institute Germany, but also um, with friends of size in Europe in Bologna. And um, thank you for making this possible. We have more than 200 participants signed up for today's session. This is uh, quite remarkable. And we have about um, 75 minutes to host this webinar and talk about the current campaign and the upcoming election. And um, this is exactly what I love to do with our Transatlantic Hub initiative um, to bring in interesting speakers uh, to curate a Ryan, nice round table um, with participants and also just to promote democracy and to strengthen this transatlantic partnership. And um, I would like to focus one minute on the logistics today. It's a webinar, which doesn't mean that we do not have a, um, a nice conversation between the two speakers, but also with the audience. So what I would like to do is ask you um, to use the chat to um, raise any questions or comments you may have. Mm. Please add your name and your affiliation so we kind of uh, know who's asking what question. That would be very helpful. We have quite a few topics today to cover. And um, we will start with one impulse by um, Ambassador John Emerson. Um, five to 10 minutes, followed then by a comment and remarks by Dan Hamilton. And after that, we have time for the conversation between the three of us and the whole group of participants. And so we have about an hour to really do the deep dive. And I'm looking forward to this. And with this, Ambassador Emerson, dear John, it's a great pleasure having you today on board. 
Um, most of you will, um, most of us will know you as the former ambassador to Germany, but you also are the chairman of the American Council on Germany, which is a very busy think tank, um, also promoting um, the transatlantic relationship and doing deep dives. And you're also the vice chairman of Capital Group International. But with this said, I'd like to hand it over to you and ask you two questions. Um, anything you would like to add to your current status and current um, CV? What is that something we do not know so far? I just found out you have some um, busy travel plans coming up um, in Germany, Cologne, Berlin, Munich. So maybe you can add on that one. And also I'd like to ask um, to kind of be, be partisan in this whole conversation. If you were to put yourself in the shoes of a Republican, what would you say about the Democratic National Committee and the nomination of the harris waltz ticket? And with this, I'm handing it over to you and enjoying your impulse on that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, Stormy. Dan, it's great to be with you. And uh, my guess is I haven't seen the list, but I probably have a lot of friends on this call. Uh, so it's wonderful to be with all of you. Um, okay, just to quickly answer your first question, which is what uh, would I add on my CV? I'm also on the board of the German Marshall Fund and uh, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and I'm the uh, on the board of the American Friends of the Munich Security Conference. Uh, what people may not know is that um, uh, one of my close friends and occasional golfing buddies is Doug Emhoff, who could well become the first first gentleman of the United States. And that my wife Kimberly and I have been uh, friends with and supporters of Kamala Harris uh, since way back in uh, 2010. And, and I was actually a Kamala appointed delegate to the convention that we just had in Chicago. Um, I'm not going to answer your put myself in the shoes of the Republican uh, Party right off the bat, but I will. I, I promise I'll get to that. But I just had a couple of thoughts I wanted to share on the election and where we are. What is um, pretty extraordinary is uh, this campaign. And, and I, I would say this is now the uh, I don't know how many uh, presidential campaigns, but I, I started being very active and engaged in this back in 1980, uh, including running Gary Hart's presidential campaign and running Clinton's campaign in California in 92, which is when we uh, turned California from red to blue, serving in the Clinton White House, and then obviously serving in uh, as President Obama's ambassador to Germany. Uh, this is the most extraordinary presidential election I have ever personally witnessed or been involved in. And if you think about it, we always talk about black swan events or October surprises, or things like that. We already have had three black swan events in this election, and they all happened within about a month. Yeah. The first one was the horrific uh, debate performance by Joe Biden, which uh, I would say was, you know, will probably go down in history as the absolute worst debate performance of any uh, presidential candidate since the Kennedy-Nixon debates, which when we started uh, these uh, televised debates. The second black swan event, of course, was the uh, assassination attempt of Donald Trump and him being shot and that iconic picture of him with his fist raised and the blood on his face, which created such a, a, a powerful contrast mm -hmm. when you can't, you, people could not unsee uh, Joe Biden in that debate, shuffling out to the podium and and, you know, kind of the way he was just appearing even during the split screen. And then you have Trump with his fist raised. And then the third black swan event, of course, was uh, just, uh, you know, about a week and a half later when Joe Biden decided not to run for president, to drop out the race and endorse Kamala Harris. And so I, I just want to say, I wouldn't be surprised if there's yet another black swan event in this most unusual uh, of election seasons. So that's that that's the first point. The second point is to look at the uh, two conventions that we just completed. I mean, the title of this talk is post convention moving into it. But I think th th this will be interesting because the one of the per there are two purposes of uh, par political party conventions. 
Purpose number one is to unify the party. Because typically you've had a primary process and you have people who are supporters of one or more, sometimes multiple candidates, and they need to all come together, get behind the nominee and, and, and unify the process. The second purpose of the convention is to uh, define the candidate and to in particular define the candidate in a way that creates a frame for the general election that your party wants. So um, as an example, the Republican party, uh, particularly after those two black swan events, and, and they were headed in this direction anyway, wanted the frame of the election to be strong versus weak. So here's Donald Trump, he's the strong man, and here's Joe Biden. He, even though he's only a couple of years older than Donald Trump, he presented as much, much older and, and almost uh, frail. And so, uh, so you had that, uh, that frame and the entirety of the convention, which, and by the way, from the Republican standpoint, at that point in time, their convention was a phenomenal success, uh, right? They came out of it unified, enthusiastic, and they just drove that strong versus weak frame, even to the point of having Hulk Hogan rip off his shirt in introducing Donald Trump and a little bit of theater there. And um, uh, and they were they were going to town on that. And 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 honestly, after that convention, it was looking I think most political analysts would say you have to give Donald Trump a pretty strong edge uh, in the general election. Well, all of a sudden, when Joe Biden stepped down. And Kamala Harris uh, performed the extraordinary political uh, task of unifying her party and solidifying support behind her. So literally within 48 hours, uh, which was I, I would say was very, very impressive, and then moved into her convention, the strong versus weak frame became irrelevant. Not only irrelevant, but maybe it even backfired or boomeranged a little bit on Donald Trump because now he's the old man running against a young, energetic uh, uh, candidate and uh, a fresh candidate. And, you know, you typically you want to run against a sitting president. Every presidential election, uh, one element of the frame, if you're a challenger, is change, right? You're, you're challenging the incumbent. You point out all the things people don't like about the incumbent. And, uh, and you're the agent of change. And that's how Donald Trump was running. And now Kamala Harris has been able to reverse that, notwithstanding the fact that she's the sitting vice president. She is now the agent of change in this election against Donald Trump. And the second thing, so instead of strong versus weak, it's you know young versus old, it's uh, change versus going back. We won't go back. We won't go back was one of the constant refrains you heard chanted at the Democratic Convention. And she has also changed the frame of this conversation about Trump being a challenge to democracy or a threat to democracy, which I'm not so sure landed all that well politically. In fact, polls showed that most a slight majority of voters thought Donald Trump would be better at protecting democracy than Joe Biden. Why? Because you got a whole bunch of people in the Republican Party who believe the big lie that the election was stolen. So you, you need Trump to protect democracy. And so she changed that frame away from that to protecting freedom. And freedom is something that uh, really resonates in American politics and certainly resonates with center and even center right voters. Freedom from the government telling you what to do when it comes to uh, choices about reproductive freedom. Freedom from a reproductive choice, freedom from uh, uh, having to send your kids to school and worry that they're going to get shot by a mass shooter. I mean, and and so they very successfully did that. So you had a hugely successful uh, Republican convention and then a tremendously successful Democratic convention that made a lot of the success of the Republican convention almost irrelevant. Uh, and, and that's sort of where we are today. Now, what does that mean politically? And then I'll, I'll just wrap with this. Um, before Biden stepped out and Harris came in and so effectively consolidated, uh, there was a very big gap between Republican base enthusiasm and likely turnout and Democratic base enthusiasm and likely turnout. 
all that this last month has done is bring parity to that, eliminate that gap. And now there's parity. Both parties are incredibly united, incredibly enthusiastic. Their bases are going to turn out. So all that means is that the election is back to where we thought it would be a year ago, a year and a half ago. If any of you heard me uh, speak at things like this in the past, I've, I've always been saying it's going to be a razor thin election decided by tens of thousands of votes, not even hundreds of thousands of votes in half a dozen swing states. And we're basically back to that, where we're looking at this handful of swing voters in six states that are going to decide this. So I would not take from the momentum that Kamala Harris has had a conclusion that, oh, wow, well, she's got this thing in the bag now. We're now back to where we were in 2016 and in 2020. It's going to be a razor thin presidential race. And maybe because I don't want to dominate too much of the time and we want to hear from Dan, I will postpone answering your question about what, what I do if I were a Republican consultant. And uh, we'll answer that later in the conversation. Well, thank you so much, John. This is really interesting and it really um, gives them some background information also on the convention. Um, Dan, I'd like you to answer to that or maybe bring in your perspectives. And um, we know each other almost for, well, 15, 20 years now too, as we just figured out. And you were a senior fellow at the Size Foreign Policy Institute and you're a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And um, I'd like to give you the same question that I just gave to John. Um, what would you like to add to your CV? And we post the, 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 the deeper bio information on, on the chat, but I'd like to listen and hear from you what you'd like to add. And also, I just recently read your, your um, commentary at Brookings that was published um, where you focus on the EU and argue that it has a playbook to de-risk from China. Um, I do not want to go too deep into the, the international policy right now, but um, you conclude by saying that if Trump is elected in November, um, the US-EU relations will face competitive impulses and mutual doubts regarding the marketplace and that these differences will likely sharpen. But if Harris wins, the transatlantic marketplace will have every reason to jointly turbocharge. And I'd like to ask you, why is it the case? Um, especially on what John just said, um, if the two parties now have their um, voters behind them again, um, what is it that will bring the voters to the ballot and also, you know, who's going to win um, if the if the country is so polarized and divided into two parts? Well, thank you, Tina. Uh, John Emerson's a hard act to follow, but I'll just round out a few points. And I think we'll defer uh, uh, the foreign policy thing to later in the discussion because we're, you know, focused right now on the U.S. domestic scene. I imagine the audience today is aware, but sometimes I find with my German colleagues, I should, you know, just make the obvious point that the U.S. system is not a parliamentary system. And, you know, we could look at overall polls, but they don't tell you much because it comes down to the Electoral College. And on our Electoral College, you have to get you know, it's 50 elections all at the same time, basically, in each state. And, and you have to win the electors from each state to get to 270 um, to win. <clears throat> and that's why, as John said, it, it despite what, you, what one reads and about momentum and these things, it comes down to a structural issue of who can win the most votes. That's why the swing states where it's really razor thin uh, become critical. That's why you're seeing the candidates spend almost all their time in those states, whether it's in Georgia or Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, uh, they're honing in on that. And so, uh, you know, we come out of those two conventions, each party energized, lots of enthusiasm. These black swans that John mentioned kind of threw everything up in the air. What I'm sensing at the moment is, as Vice President Harris, it's not just a campaign, it's sort of got some momentum to it, some, some movement. You can see it when volunteers 
uh, you know, do things on their own where the campaign's not asking them to do stuff. They just are so enthusiastic. They are out there doing their own campaigning and all buttons and stickers and memes and social media. You saw that with Republicans as well, but I, I think there's a sense right now of some enthusiasm on the Democratic side that had not been there. But the, you know, the question is in the swing states, we'll come back to that, but I think that's really the question, who who can get that margin in those states? And just to reiterate, if people aren't paying that much attention, you, you're talking about a state like Arizona in the West, maybe Nevada, and you're talking about the state of Georgia in the South, you're maybe North Carolina, and you're talking about the key states in the uh, Midwest of Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Uh, and that, you know that re that's really where the debate is happening. Um, the next thing coming up, the next black swan, maybe by, might be the next debate. So next week already, uh, the two candidates are going to have a debate. And uh, you know, as John said, then the the roles are reversed. The old guy in the room will be Donald Trump, uh, and then we'll see how they each perform. They've never even met each other. These two people, uh, believe it or not. Uh, and yet they're going to debate, right, uh, for the presidency. The other point I just simply make is our election is, of course, not just for the presidency, but also for the Congress. And uh, we have one third of the U.S. Senate and the entire House of Representatives up for uh, re-election. And in our system, since the president does, you know, the executive does not come out of the legislature, it's really quite important who's going to win in the Congress, who has the majority in each house. And there the dynamics are also interesting because Mitch McConnell, the minor, current minority leader in the Senate, the Republican, is not going to uh, campaign again for that job. So if the Republicans take the majority, you'll have new leadership. And the question is, who's that be? They haven't decided. And it's very hard for the Democrats because of the uh, uh, seats in the Senate. Eight, eight are competitive and they're all Democratic seats. Uh, and so, uh, and Senator Manchin from West Virginia, a, a Democrat, this year turned independent. So they already lost that seat. They're probably going to lose it to the Republican candidate, who's the governor of West Virginia. And so the Democrats basically have to win all the other seats to retain the majority. That's going to be very hard. And in the House, there are about 44 seats that are competitive. <clears throat> and so it's hard to predict that. It could be that you, what you see is a flip. You see that the Democrats maybe have majority in the House and the Republicans in the, in the Senate, and that would, again, be divided government no matter who wins. So it's just important to always remember the Congress here. And then just some other key issues that are likely to influence uh, issues in the swing states or on the margins. One is the Roe versus Wade Supreme Court decision, the issue of abortion or reproductive freedom which is, be, is really uh, enthused a lot of uh, women voters, also moderate Republican women, to come out and campaign uh, in ways they pro maybe not, would not have before. You see a huge gender gap on that issue uh, among voters. And in certain states, it actually becomes a very specific thing. In Arizona, for instance, there is a measure on the ballot on the same day, election day, on abortion issues. And if the Democrats are so enthused, uh, it, it could influence also how they vote on other things when, the, when they're in the voting booth. So little things like that could make a difference in a state like Arizona, where it's very tight. The other is the, dis the sort of disenchanted Republican voters. You know, who, who wanted to vote for Nikki Haley? Who The Republicans that were not pro-Trump, which way will they go now? And that's up in the air, but it's um, there are a number of people. Liz Cheney, a very former House in the House leadership, yesterday endorsed Kamala Harris. Uh, the other is is the third party uh, option, which had been Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who has decided to join Donald Trump. But what's interesting is he can't get his name off the ballot in a few key states like Wisconsin and Michigan. So even though he's not running, if someone's not really paying attention and they liked him, they might vote for him on the ballot, which will take away from Trump uh, in a couple of those key states. 
And what we've seen is sometimes this third party element does really influence things in some uh, key states. Hillary Clinton, you could argue, lost the U.S. election because of third party elements. Al Gore uh, lost the election, and particularly because of Ralph Nader's third party. Bill Clinton won the election against George Sr. Uh, Bush because of Ross Perot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we, we tend to think we have a two party system, but sometimes that third element really is quite important. Last couple of points is, you know, in the United States, we have a huge independent voter base. 30%, I think, of, of Americans are independent. And Kamala Harris has an 8% margin, uh, a plus margin with independent voters in all of the swing states. So if they really get out and vote and they vote in the way that it seems, that's going to be helpful to her. And then we have a new element in the United States in the last, you know, number of years of early voting. So election day, we tend to focus on election day, but the Americans, a lot of them vote by mail these days, or many states allow early voting. You can, you don't have to start on election day, one day to vote. You can, some states two weeks ahead and, and so on. Hmm. And in the 2020 election, 70%, 70% of voters voted before election day. Uh, so this is already basically starting. Um, and uh, the people least likely to vote, voters who, you know, registered voters least likely to vote are uh, in favor of Trump. So they're energized, but are they actually going to vote? And so, and they tend to vote on election day, not early. The early voters tend to vote, uh, voted for Biden uh, overwhelmingly last time. So these are things that maybe people won't pay attention to, but I think will be the slight, given this razor thin uh, margins that John was talking about, these little things could actually uh, matter. So let me leave it at that and simply say, if you look at the swing states um, and you, you really look at where it's the tightest, it's probably in Georgia and Pennsylvania. And, it, and uh, if you really look at that, and, and there, let me tell re, uh, people who are watching, if you'd like to have your own fun game with this, you go to a website called 270 to win, 270 to win, and you can do your own electoral map of the, of the election. You can plug in who you think is going to win what states, and you'll see how it turns out. If you do that, and Kamala Harris actually lost Pennsylvania, which people say is a must win for her, but she won Georgia, she'd still get 273 electoral votes. And if she wins Pennsylvania, but loses Georgia, the Democrats have 276 electoral votes. So, um, you know, th these are the factors that one has to think about. And of course, the implications for Europe and our relationship, uh, I'm sure we'll want to talk. About. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, and as much as I, I like what you say and like to hear what you say. Um, we have a, I know that we have participants um, listening who who share also a different view. Um, and in Germany and in, in the transatlantic scene, it often seems that um, we like to hear only the one voice and not the other and are in the end surprised by another um, presidency of of Donald Trump. And um, this just doesn't happen by accident. It is because, um, because of your, your electoral system and also by um, that former President Trump um, speaks to a lot of people. And I'd like to understand that a little bit better. And this is what I'd like to come back to one point you just made on the Congress election. And um, in our abstract, we wrote about um, the down ballot races and maybe we can jump into that topic right now and um, kind of um, maybe not all of them, all of our participants already know what that is. And I had to look it up myself too. And maybe you can kind of explain what it is and how it is relevant for the upcoming election. And in the end, also, what does it mean for the transatlantic relationship if local governments are, are elected? Um, and also, what does it mean if there's a shift in, in the House and in the Senate? And I, I leave it up to you to answer either John or Daniel. Well, there's there's a lot to that question. Uh, but let me just say on the 
one sided, both sides situation. That's why I don't present advocacy. I only present analysis. And if you if I were a Republican consultant, he would have said exactly what I said. Republicans had a great, strong convention. Biden stepping out upended it. Democrats had a great, strong convention that do not overestimate the Kamala momentum. This election will be razor thin and will be decided literally by tens of thousands of votes in a half a dozen states. I mean, that that is universally accepted as a as a fact in terms of the question of the intensity of the political support for Donald Trump. Remember this in 2020, when he lost the presidency, he got more votes po on the popular vote side than any person ever running for president in the history of the United States except for Joe Biden in 2020. And if only 40,000 votes had changed in the right places in three states, Arizona, Georgia, um, and Wisconsin, Donald Trump would have again won an electoral college majority. So it's a very, very narrowly split country. And I think to get a, uh, an understanding of the, the Trump voter, it uh, what he did he he's he's like a turnout machine what he did was he brought and this is why in 2016 a lot of the hillary clinton metrics were so wrong about where she might win or do well he brought to the polls people that often don't vote he created lots of new voters and transformed the republican party and if you want to understand uh the dynamic that led to that just look at the elections that you all just had uh, in, um, you know, the, the former GDR. I mean, that the, the dynamic that um, uh, that ha has led both the far left and the far right, people who are very frustrated with what the governing center has provided for them, that and, and are basically expressing that in their vote. Uh, that was very much the dynamic that that drove Donald Trump and has driven his uh, electoral success. Um, so now on the local level, I mean, Dan is right. There's probably, I mean, who wins the presidency is going to be hugely important, but whether they'll be able to implement all they're talking about will depend very much on who controls Congress. And I would say there is a uh, nothing certain in politics, but you got to, it's pretty close to certain that the Republicans will control the Senate. And the reason is because right now the Democrats control the Senate 51 49. And with Joe Manchin not running in West Virginia, hopefully this isn't too in the weeds, uh, Republicans will win West Virginia. So now it's a 50 50 Senate. The Democrats have seven seats that are fairly vulnerable that they must win to keep it at a 50-50 Senate. And there, there's not one credibly vulnerable Republican-controlled seat today. So, um, uh, and if it's a 50-50 Senate, the vice president casts the time vote. So the only way that Democrats control the Senate is not only that Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz win, but that the tie vote, I, I, but that the Democrats run the table and win all seven of those uh, um, of those, you know, challenging Senate races. So I think and, and by the way, the markets tend to like a split Congress because it means you're not going to go too far to the left or too far the, to the right in terms of the policies that are ultimately implemented. And then I'll just say one other thing and, and then throw it to Dan. I think the down ballot, whether it's the state legislatures uh, or governors or mayors um, in, uh, it, it, you know, in, 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 or, or Congress has uh, sort of different impacts on the transatlantic relationship or foreign policy in general. Even if the Republicans control both houses of the, uh, of Congress and the Democrats control uh, the White House, the Democrats are going to drive foreign policy. And the vice, the uh, opposite is true. If if Trump wins and control and the Democrats win, well, they're not going to win the Senate. If Trump wins, by definition, they control the Senate. But the Democrats control the House. The Republicans are going to control foreign policy. Foreign policy in this country is very much driven out 
of the White House, just as in Germany, it's really driven out of the chancellery, regardless of who the foreign minister is. And so um, you probably, there'll be vast differences between the Harris approach and the and the Trump approach to foreign policy. Those will continue regardless of who controls Congress. But on the state and local level, uh, virtually every governor, Democrat or Republican, does trade missions to Europe, does trade missions to Asia, trade missions to Latin America. They're looking to build relationships and bring business into their state. So the Republican governor of South Carolina is going to be coming to Germany to talk to, B, to BMW about you know, the wonderful factories that they've built in South Carolina. And the Republican governor of Tennessee is going to be coming out here to talk to VW about the factory they have in Chattanooga. Um, you know, and uh, uh, and the Democratic governors of, you know, of New Jersey, Phil Murphy, my predecessor as ambassador, going to be coming out to talk about business that can be done with New Jersey. So almost regardless of what the broader foreign policy approach is at the gubernatorial level and even at the level of certainly big city mayors, there's always an interest in continuing to engage in the level of the transatlantic relationship that often that's so vitally important, but often gets lost when people are thinking about what the presidents are doing and how their relationship is with the chancellor. Don't forget that the business, the economic, and the people-to-people -people aspect of the transatlantic relationships are all vitally important. And I think those are bound to continue regardless of the foreign policy approach of whoever's sitting in the White House. Then do you share just, that view? Yeah. Well, just on your for, on your specific question on the Don Bell, I mentioned some of that, um, but John has rounded that out. You know, there are Donald Trump uh, was successful in picking up many disaffected voters who thought the Democratic Party had left them behind, and uh, he has tried to tap into that before. Or um, there, you see divides in, in the United States, you know, rural versus urban areas, huge, huge divides there with the rural areas really tending to go for the Republicans and the urban areas becoming primarily Democratic. You can go to a state like Minnesota or even Maryland, where I live, probably California, and you get out of the cities, uh, you know, there are big Trump signs. It's very energetic. It's just a very different uh, space. If you look at a map of the United States by county uh, from the last elections, uh, in 2016 in particular, uh, where Trump won against Hillary Clinton, it is a mass, it's all red, uh, you know, if you do it by county rather than by, you know, the electoral way we do it. So uh, in terms of land space, in terms of uh, these kinds of things, you know, Donald Trump has been very successful. And part of it, I would argue, is... Uh, some failings the Democrats have had. Uh, I just tell you one anecdote. I spent a lot of time in Minnesota, which is, you know, the state of Governor Walls, but northeastern Minnesota is a mining area. It's Duluth, Minnesota. It is the home of uh, European immigrants from Germany and Croatia and Finland and Scandinavia. It's It was the home, the heart of what's called the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. In Minnesota, it's not the Democratic Party, it's the Democrat Farmer Labor. It's probably the closest thing you're gonna to get to a European uh, political party in the United States. It's the, uh, Walter Mondale, Hubert Humphrey, very progressive, always democratic. And they now elect Republican uh, members of Congress. And I uh, have many friends there and I spoke to one activist, 90 year old woman I've known forever, and I said, you know, just tell me, you know, what whatever happened? And she said, you know, uh, we, we didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left us. Uh, it started to focus on the Twin Cities in Minneapolis-St. Paul, the urban issues, and forgot about, you know, the rest of the country. Uh, there was great uproar about rural broadband, why many parts of the United States didn't have access to the Internet for years. The Democrats have figured this out now. They're talking about this. And I think the one thing about Harris's campaign is she's been laser focused on the center, on the middle class. Don't veer off on any tangential issues that some Democratic constituencies might. She's not doing the Hillary 
you know, theme of feminist foreign policy or domestic policy or anything like that. She is not doing that. She's reaching out, staying as hard as she can to the center so that these other issues don't uh, come up. And, that, and you know, that's part of the uh, dynamic. Uh, I think there are some uh, implications to the Congress um, in terms of, since we, I seek a lot of questions here on foreign policy, so maybe just to veer slightly, you know, as John says, the executive has the initiative in foreign policy. The Senate power in this regard is about treaties. We don't do treaties very well. You got to get two thirds, you know, of the U.S. Senate to agree to a treaty. When it comes to something like NATO, the Senate's been very, you know, successful. We we passed the uh, amended North Atlantic Treaty, taken Sweden and Finland, even under Trump's administration, he presided over the enlargement of NATO to two other countries, despite his own sort of qualms. So the Senate does play a role. The Senate bucked, Republican senators bucked Trump's efforts to pull troops out of Germany, to hollow out NATO, to uh, reduce the defense budget for Europe. Uh, that The opposition to Trump came from Republicans in the Senate. So the Senate can play a role, even if it's a Republican majority that starts to veer into foreign policy issues of interest to Europe. The House has a particular role, two roles that are also relevant, and you can see the Republican minor, uh, majority right now using them. One is the budget, the power of the purse. Money bills come out of the House. You saw the whole, whole debate went on for months about support for Ukraine. It was rooted in the House of Representatives because that's the body that has to do these things. So there is some power here in our division of labor system to, um, to the opposing party from the White House being in control of the House of Representatives. The other is, is what we call oversight. So uh, a majority in the, if it's a Democratic majority in the House and it's a Republican president, they will conduct all sorts of hearings and investigations because that's what they can do. Uh, just as you see the Republicans right now doing all of that with, uh, with the Biden administration. So those on the margin, again, may not be huge issues, but on some specific issues like Ukraine, it actually does matter. And that's the kind of divided government issues that we'll have to contend with. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, and as I just said, there are coming in some some questions on on foreign policy, and I'd like, just like to reach out to the audience again. Please, um, you know, send in your questions and remarks, um, so I can add them to the discussion. Um, we now focus a little bit more on the domestic view and also on you know, on the um, state level. But what is your perception on? on Harris policy, foreign policy, what can we expect from her um, as she's just beginning to reveal her own policies? And do we expect similar steps like we had with Biden or the same question, what does Germany has to fear and what maybe hope for when President Trump will be reelected? Um, maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Well, I think um, the... Harris foreign policy obviously is going to evolve over time, but fundamentally, uh, I would say it's uh, going to be largely a continuation of what we've seen under President Biden with some uh, differences. So as it relates to her approach to um, uh, our alliances, our values based alliances, uh, our relationship with it with NATO, um, our relationship with uh, the Quad or AUKUS in uh, uh, in the West. I, I mean, in in the Pacific. Uh, I, I think that um, there's no question she will be deeply committed to working with our alliances uh, in terms of um, uh, pursuing uh, agreed upon objectives. Uh, so there's no question about that. Uh, it's a very different approach from America First, which is uh, at least seems to have evolved as much more, um, you know, kind of pulling back, pulling our wings in, much more skeptical of uh, America's ability to drive foreign uh, policy or to drive international events. And uh, I think also... Um, it, it's very populist in the sense of saying, why should we be spending money on Ukraine when we should be spending the money here at home? There's a political appeal to the uh, to the Trump America first uh, piece of this. 
Uh, so I think you see some a pretty big difference there. Uh, she unquestionably would be deeply committed to uh, Ukraine. She's given that message at the last three Munich security conferences. She came to each of those and spoke uh, quite forcibly about uh, continuing to support Ukraine. Um, J.D. Vance, the uh, you know vice presidential nominee on the Republican side, is sort of the leader, at least in the Senate. And and boy, Dan's absolutely right about the the Senate having uh, a, a significant role in all this. Uh, you know, he's the leader in the Senate of uh, making the argument, and he did this at the last Munich Security Conference. Actually, he came there and spoke uh, about um, uh, that that we should be pulling out of Ukraine and we shouldn't be as engaged there. Um, I do think that you may see a difference in tone, if not approach, when it comes to uh, the Middle East. Uh, Harris made very clear in her acceptance speech, she will absolutely um, uh, do everything in her power to uh, help uh, protect and defend Israel and to help Israel uh, in, in its ability to defend itself. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and, you know, her condemnation of Hamas and, uh, uh, you know, the, the various organizations uh, within the Mideast, uh, Hezbollah, um, the Houthis, uh, that are really disruptive and, and, and effectively terrorist organizations in the way they operate. And at the same time, expressed great concern, and I think she used the word heartbreaking, uh, uh, concern about what was happening in Gaza and about the uh, the, the tragedy uh, developing with regard to the people, the, the Palestinian people, and the need to push forward to make sure that the Palestinian people ultimately have a sense of self determination. So, so I think that the tonal difference is probably a little bit more uh, with a, a, a sensitivity to what's happening on the ground than, than perhaps what we've seen from the Biden administration. And on China, I think her approach, uh, yeah, by the way, one of the, I'd be interested in Dan's thoughts on this. One of my great surprises in this campaign is both parties have been relatively silent about China. I thought China was going to be, a, a year ago, if you'd asked me, I'd say they both uh, nominees would be falling all over themselves to show that they're tougher on China than the other person. And uh, and that really hasn't happened. I mean, China just got barely a mention in both um, uh, acceptance speeches uh, at the conventions. And I think um, uh, I think the Harris approach would continue the Biden approach, which is let's lower the temperature somewhat. Let's treat China not as adversarial on everything across the board, but uh, as adversarial where we need to be. South China Sea and Taiwan being examples of that, uh, but largely as competitor. Uh, of ours and and let's act accordingly with regard to that. So the uh, a much more rifle shot when you talk about using tariffs instead of an across the board uh, tariff uh, imposition, which is what Trump is talking about, imposing tariffs on every item that it, you know, are imported into the United States. Instead of doing something like that, much more focused approach towards tariffs and towards restrictions on U.S. companies or U.S. based investments in certain sectors uh, of China's economy, particularly um, AI, military grade technology, um, advanced biotechnology, semiconductors, uh, those kinds of things. And working to cooperate with China on things like climate change, nuclear nonproliferation, and continuing the effort to try to prevent the importing uh, importation illegally of fentanyl into the United States. So I think that would be, uh, it'd be sort of a, keeping the temperature a little bit lower and there'd be a coordination with, as opposed to simply a more adversarial approach to China from Kamala Harris. So, and that, and that's pretty much a continuation of where Biden has been uh, on that policy. And can you maybe deepen that just with regard to Germany and the transatlantic relationship, what to expect, especially um, on the economic side, tariffs, um, is it going to be, a nice tone, but strict policy, or are we going to see even um, a stricter way how um, Kamala Harris is going to carry it out? Um, or what do you expect here for the Germans? 
Well, one thing I don't expect is a return to the era when I was ambassador, where we were working really hard to negotiate and conclude negotiations on the TTIP trade agreement, a, a big trade agreement between the EU and the United mm -hmm. States. Um, I do not, I have not seen anything about her trade policy and whether she would move towards maybe a mini TTIP, like with the auto industry or something along those lines. Uh, so I don't, not quite sure where we would uh, stand on that. You know, Dan talked about, uh, you know, we, we don't do treaties very well. I, I don't think at, at, any more of the politics of our country, we don't do big tra trade agreements very well either. And so uh, I wouldn't expect that. I would um, expect the relationship, though, to be um, uh, fairly strong and significant. Uh, it, you know, I always talked about Germany as being the indispensable nation. Uh, to the United States. I think our ties are so broad and deep. The fact that she has come to three Munich security conferences and every time she does, she has bilateral meetings with, uh, you know, leaders of the German government, uh, met with the uh, chancellor several times, uh, for instance. I think that um, uh, you can anticipate a very strong and honest and, and forthright relationship with Germany. Uh, and And I think that you know, you can simply go back. We know what the relationship would be like with Trump because we just had it for four years between the United States and Germany. And I don't see any reason to think that it would be any different uh, on a go forward basis. I'm sorry if that's not more specific for you. But this is and all good. I would, I would think as you, if you look at the two, contrast the two, you start with who they are as individuals. Um, because I think they're very different personalities when you when it comes to making policy. Uh, Donald Trump is a you know gut politician, a instinctive. He follows his instincts rather than trying to do big analysis, uh, and uh, he tends to do that in such a way that even as close as advisors always have said, they don't really know what he's going to do. He doesn't even know what he's going to do until he does it. And because of that, it's hard to calculate. We like to predict what it'll be like, but I don't think uh, I don't think it's possible, really. So you can only go with the instincts. You know, Mike Pompeo, the, his former Secretary of State, said he would be in these meetings with Trump, and Trump would say, you know, he would say, here are you know options from safe to extreme, and maybe Trump would pick the extreme option. He said, okay, we'll go do that. Uh, I'll come back to you when it's fleshed out. He comes back to him with the extreme option, and then Trump says, well, that's too extreme. We're not going to do that. Uh, that's the type of thing that repeatedly happened in the Trump administration, where the instinct was to do one thing and then something else happened. But, you know, former ambassador, German ambassador Peter Wittig, you know, said when the Trump was elected, the Germans thought, OK, well, the office may, will make the man right. He will be constrained by the constraints of his office. And then Wittig said in the end, you know, that didn't prove to be true. Uh, and so they also found it very hard to deal with. I think Kamala Harris is a calculating politician, just the opposite. She is, you can just see the way she's running a campaign. Everything is tightly calculated to try to get to 270 votes. And so I can, she's a prosecutor. She is, a, you know, a lawyer. She's going to approach foreign policy with that same sense as a person. And, and again, then what happens will be different. So if you, you know, if you think of, I agree with John said, a lot of Biden continuity, mainstream democratic continuity, but there'll be some differences. I think continue to support on Ukraine, but press Europe to do much more uh, as possible. She has said she would have a member of the Republican party in her cabinet. Sometimes that means the defense position because you can see that she might feel defensive, pardon the pun, about being ready on national security issues. And that's what some uh, Democratic presidents in the past who've had that situation have appointed a Republican to be Secretary of Defense. So that might be something, it's hard to know. Um, and you know, she's not Joe Biden in the sense that Europe is intuitively important to her. She gets it in an intellectual way, but she doesn't feel it in her bones like Joe Biden did. In that sense, she's more like Obama, frankly, in terms of he, she gets it, but it's not a you know, first reaction. One, you have to talk her through it, probably. 
And then the reality of that, despite whatever uh, she thinks, I believe she's going to be tested very early by some other power, whether it's China or Russia or Iran or you name it, because there's going to be this impression that she, you know, right or wrong, is a woman untested. She's she's not going to be ready for real foreign policy challenges. And I would not be surprised to see some real hard tests right away. And, you know, in our system, even a, a, a friendly transition from one some same president of the same party to another, there's a lot of personnel turnover. We usually don't get our government in place for, you know, nine months after a presidential election. So in that space of chaos, transition, and questioning to be challenged by another uh, major power uh, is going to be tough, and I bet it will happen. So I just say that. Back to Trump, you know, I think, as I said, his, his instinct is impulsive, but also transactional. You can see most of his foreign policy is very transactional. He will threaten, he will cajole, he'll do whatever to get a higher price out of the person he's talking to. So much of the debate about European defense spending, you know, is an effort to get the Europeans to pay up. But he has been very clear that maybe he wouldn't defend everybody if they don't pay, meet the 2%, you know, spending uh, target or more. Uh, that's a way not only to uh, push that spending, but it is uh, uh, what happens is that you lose trust in whether the U.S. will come to your aid. And, you know, the, the Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, the mutual defense arrangement, is in the end really just based on trust. It's a political, you know, thing. It's not a, there's no, nothing binding you to do anything. And if European allies lose trust in the U.S., uh, that is difficult uh, for the alliance. Uh, he has said he and his and some of his advisors said, "Well, the plan. Well, let's let's put the U.S. on standby in NATO. Maybe we'll be there. Maybe we won't. If it really gets bad, we might support them. But maybe maybe only those who will support us. I think you'd see a revival of efforts to move troops out of Germany, uh, maybe to Poland uh, or elsewhere. He was doing that in his last year in office." Uh, you know, you can make have a military logic right now in particular that says that's what one should do. Uh, there are military advisors who think that's what one should do. So you could maybe see that uh, happening. And he has said across the, uh, I mean, on, on Ukraine, I mean, we can't ignore this. So he has said, for some time, he said on day one, he'd solve the, you know, Ru the Russian invasion of Ukraine issue. The last debate with Joe Biden, he said, I'll do it by the time of my inauguration. So he gave himself a little more time. The only way you do this, in my view, is you sell out the Ukrainians. I don't see another way of doing that. Uh, so if that's what he's going to do, you can see, in my view, part of the Ukrainian calculation to go into Russian territory uh, recently is to give themselves the best negotiating hand they can have if they are being forced to to the negotiating table. Uh, they're not going to, you know, they have no claim on Russian territory, like Putin says he has claim on Ukrainian territory. But if they're in control of it and they're forced to negotiate, maybe there will be something more for them there. So, you know, U.S. politics is playing a role right now, I think, in how Ukraine is conducting the war, and they're very nervous about what, what will happen. It's hard to know what will happen, but uh, Trump has already signaled he's not you know, inclined to just keep supporting uh, the Ukrainians. And then on your point on the on the economics and on Germany and the EU on tariffs. So he said across the board, I'm not sure that that would happen uh, because that is uh, very hard to do. And uh, I think the deeper issue is to, you know, understand Donald Trump does not think the European Union is in the interest of the United States. He has repeatedly supported efforts to uh, well, Brexit, he, he loved Brexit. And he also has, you know, signed signed on with many uh, European countries that they're, they're EU members, but they'd like, a, you know, Europe of nationalities of sovereign states rather than more power to Brussels. And you could see his election, I think, would empower those voices in Europe uh, and not only in Hungary. You could see in Italy, for instance, uh, uh, Prime Minister Maloney has 
played played the role of being a good ally with the United States while she does a, a conservative, very conservative policies internally. But if there's a new political dynamic in the United States, maybe that would shift. Also in Italy's view of EU uh, dynamics. So what you would end up with, and, and you have somebody like, frankly, Rick Grinnell, uh, another predecessor <laughs> of, the, of the ambassadors, uh, saying, you know, it's really not in our interest. We have to we have to disaggregate. That was the term that George W. Bush administration used vis-a-vis -vis the EU. Play the Europeans off against each other, because frankly, it's so easy to do. Uh, the U.S. refrains from that, usually, but not always. But if that's the explicit policy, Europe would be faced with, the, which, with its three main protagonists, the United States, Russia, and China, each committed to uh, playing the Europeans off against each other and, and splitting up uh, European Union to the extent they could. I think that's the situation you would face. Now, whether Europe, I hear a lot of brave talk in, in Europe, if I may add my editorial here on, well, that means we'll build a stronger Europe. I think the opposite is likely to be the case. I think it would be a crumbling and Europeans would start to look over the shoulder at each other again because they're not sure. Not only can they not trust the U.S., but they can't trust each other necessarily. And it would be a movie we've seen before, unfortunately. That's my um, editorial. Last point I would say is what unites the two? Because we maybe don't talk about that. I think there are two issues where there is a broad bipartisan consensus in the United States that has implications for Europe. One is China. As John said, it's. I think foreign policy just doesn't play that much of a role, except like the Middle East right now, of course, does uh, in campaigns. But both there is a very broad, sweeping sense among both parties that China is a pure competitor, and we have to face it. We have to stare it down and do take to policies that will confront it in in many ways, realizing we're uh, deeply interdependent. And while Trump would pull more to the what we call the decoupling thing, really pull the economies apart, I'm not sure he can do that. Whereas, as John said, I think a Harris administration would try to fine tune that more uh, and focus more on the high end areas, technology and so on, defense related issues where you de-risk, as, as they say. Uh, so redefining the terms of interdependence, that is a huge impact on Germany as I know Germany right now is you know, debating its own relationship with China exactly in that area. The other area uh, I think where there is a common sense across the parties is on burden sharing with Europe. I think there is just a sense now in the United States, uh, Europe simply has to step up. You know, we have, we have the biggest war in Europe since World War II. And there's not a sense in this country, rightly or wrongly, that the Europeans are doing all that they can do to, you know, to, to work with us on this. So it rightly or wrongly, it's bipartisan. That's the point. So whoever wins in the presidency or in the two houses of Congress, this pressure on Europe to step up will simply continue. And it's not one where one president or the other is necessarily going to make a big difference. Well, I want to underscore that point. I think that's a great point, Dan. Uh, in fact, I think your whole recitation there was brilliant. <laughs> I'd like to bottle that. Um, the uh, don't forget it was Barack Obama. You know, Donald Trump gets a lot of attention for the you know uh, really pounding on Europe to pay more in NATO and all that. Obama is the one who coined the phrase "free riders," and uh, it was at the uh, NATO summit in Wales in 2014 where the Obama administration, and by the way, um, Phil Gordon, who is Kamala Harris's national security advisor and probably will continue, could be expected to continue in that role in uh, the West Wing, um, if sh should she uh, win, uh, was a part of this, where it was the uh, Obama administration that pressed Europe to agree to this 2% uh, situation. They obviously didn't get there. It took a one-two punch from, you know, the Obama administration and Trump administration to start getting them there. But but there's no question that is uh, uh, an issue of real bipartisan uh, focus in, in the United States. 
Thank you so much for this terrific deep dive on foreign policy, um, especially also with regard to Germany and what to expect from um, you know, the new potential presidents. We only have like a couple minutes left and um, asking for a short answer. Um, what would you tell particularly the Germans to watch out for um, the next couple of weeks um, until the election actually takes place? What are you hoping um, the Germans and the transatlantic partnership is focusing on? Um, is it to keep an eye on what's going on or um, to have the media um, report both sides um, of, of, the, um, of the election? Or what is it, John, that you were hoping the Germans to do? Well, I mean, if you're talking about between now and the election, I would say several things. One, that I something I've been pounding on for a long time, uh, way before Donald Trump got the nomination, Germany needs to prepare for the eventuality that Donald Trump could come in for a second term and that a Trump 2.0 would be, uh, I think, quite different uh, since he would be, and then this is coming from John Bolton, who is his national security advisor, in a conversation we had, with without guardrails uh will be uh perhaps even more disruptive uh in terms of Europe and Germany than the Trump 1.0 so number one you can put that in mind that that could very well happen and, and be prepared for that number two just in terms of what to pay attention to Dan said it at the beginning just focus on the swing states the national polls are irrelevant uh, it's, it really is those six. I, I think North Carolina as Democrats always talk about it is a bridge too far. Um, and if you really want to focus on, you don't want to focus on six States, focus on the three in the upper Midwest that Hillary lost, which is the reason Trump won the electoral college majority in 2016, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And, um, uh, I, I think that is uh, uh, going to be something to really uh, pay attention to. Understand that something could happen in the final week before the election. While, while Dan mentions that there's early voting, a lot of swing voters aren't going to necessarily vote early, um, that could upend this thing. You had the... Um, you know, you had the Comey investigation of Hillary's emails. It was resumed a week or so before that, uh, you know, potentially uh, upended uh, that. We have a war in the Middle East. We have the possibility. Immigration is a huge issue and the border security. There could be something with uh, someone who's in the country illegally, commits a crime or even accidentally you know, hits and kills a child driving illegally, that you can just imagine what would happen in the last week, or you could have a, a court in a deep red state uh, come down with a ruling that ineffectively, as the Alabama Supreme Court did a number of months ago, uh, you know, basically would, would render uh, in vitro fertilization impossible uh, or illegal in that state, uh, something like that, that, that would put reproductive freedom right at the top. That those, those differences and difference in attention in the last week could, um, you know, be a swing that could change this election. So I'd kind of hold my, keep my powder dry and watch that. And for sure, as Dan said, the you know, next black swan event could be this debate. I would watch the debate. I think way too much is being made about Kamala Harris as a prosecutor and blah, blah, blah. Donald Trump has very little to lose in this debate. Uh, he is so baked into American politics. People know what they think about him. They know who he is. Uh, he's going to have an opportunity to just go and, you know, let, let loose against Kamala Harris. And everybody's going to be focused on her. How is she going to handle this? What is she going to say? How is she going to hold up during the debate? Who is she as a person? Um, uh, there's going to be a lot of interest on that. And so the idea of, you know, to your first question, you asked me, well, what would I advise a as a Republican consultant? I would say work, do my darndest to keep my candidate disciplined on trying to define Kamala Harris in a way that will be unappealing to the center, the political center of this country. And um, and we'll see if that happens in the debate and we'll see how she handles that uh, in the debate. And it's going to be much more about her defining herself than her defining Donald Trump, because 
we all know and, and have our opinions on Donald Trump. So those would be the things I would pay attention to. Thank you so much, John. Dan, do you want to add something? Ask well, just also briefly, really let me just uh, yeah, answer. just I just see one uh, thing in the chat. I just want to respond to though the point about I made about Al Gore and Ralph Nader, uh, and the person says it wasn't true. Uh, it's not about the Supreme Court uh, uh, deciding that election. It was that Ralph Nader took so many votes from Gore and some swing states at during the election that on election day, if he hadn't been a third party candidate, Gore would have probably won those states. It wouldn't have never gone to the Supreme Court. That was the point I was trying to make. On, on you know, what can people do between now and the election in Germany? Not, uh, you know, not a lot. Uh, uh, you know, my advice is don't focus on us, focus on yourself. Um, you know, there's discussions how to prepare for a U.S. election um, uh, and a new president or because we're going to have one. Um, and so my only my only advice would be as those preparations are being made. Uh, think about building up Europe as and being clear within EU debates that the Euro European Union it really should be America's counterpart and not a counterweight. And there are many voices in Europe, especially if a Trump administration should be elected, that say you have to build up Europe as the counterweight to the United States. I think that's a failed mission. It would only aggravate the ways the U.S. would pursue a policy of disaggregation again against the EU. I don't think that's in Germany's interest. I think we've always done best when the EU and the United States see each other as partners and in counterparts and the eu equips itself with the tools it can uh, it can have to be that counterpart but that's a daily debate in brussels and in european capitals and i don't think americans are you know pay as much attention to that as you should and germany would tip the scales on those debates if it chose to as you prepare the only thing i'd say in terms of between now and november is what are the couple surprises on their electoral map uh, it, I'm not predicting this, but I say if you want to, you know, if you're really a, a wonky politics nerd here, look at Virginia. Virginia is very close. Virginia has has been a very conservative state, you know, for for a long, long time, and then suddenly went uh, and started electing Democrats. And so people aren't talking about Virginia and the national conversation, uh, putting it in the Democratic camp, but it's tight. It's tighter than it should be. So that's one. The other is North Carolina. John thinks it's out of reach for the Democrats. But again, back to surprises. If there is some sort of real movement behind Harris and Georgia goes for the Democrats, then you know there's an outside chance that North Carolina would do that. And if either of those really tip uh, one way or the other, that would uh, negate the importance of a states like Pennsylvania one way or the other. So uh, it, you could have a funny map where, you know, the Democrats lose Virginia, but win Pennsylvania or the other way around. And I, the, 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 these are the surprises. We've been accustomed now in our politics to have some surprises. So I, I want to put those down as more to come, probably. By the way, I would add New Hampshire to that. And uh, yeah. that's where Kamala Harris was two days ago. Yeah. If you want to know what's important to a campaign and where they see both their opportunities and vulnerabilities, look at the candidate schedule. They start showing up in a play. If, if Kamala Harris starts showing up in Virginia a lot, as an example, that means that their pollsters are telling them, you could be in trouble here. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a great, that's a great point uh, to make, Dan. Yeah, and coming back to those black swans, I think there's a lot to watch out for. Um, we are definitely running out of time, and I'd like to hand over to my colleague, who's going just to uh, do some closing remarks to Elisa and without not not without saying a special thanks to John and Daniel for giving all your insights and behind the scenes information. I think there's still a lot going on until um, November 5th. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, deepen this discussion and keep it going. But with this, I'd like to hand over to Elisa um, to just do some closing remarks real quick. Maybe you can turn on your camera also because Currently, you're not seen. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I can only say as well, um, uh, following uh, Tina's comment, thank you so much. That was absolutely um, 
really insightful, really interesting. And um, I, I mean, I took a lot away. Maybe if I can just take um, two minutes to not to summarize because it was just too much was said and too much um, was said that could be developed a lot more. But um, I think there's two things which um, really struck me from what you you both commented. Um, firstly, um, in Europe, I think there's what you rightly said, a euphoria about Harris and um, the perspectives of the outcome of the elections now, which maybe we see <clears throat> a little bit more positive than we did a few months ago. But as you quite rightly uh, pointed out, it's extremely tight. So um, we will hold our horses and, um, and, 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 and follow closely in the next um, months to see what happens. And it's gonna be very fascinating, I think. And the second comment, which I think was uh, really interesting and which personally I also believe is, um, is this issue of foreign policy. Now, um, you said foreign policy, um, what both of them will do, Harris, for example, will, will develop and we'll see over time. But um, this, this comment that um, it's a bipartisan approach that, um, and if I can quote you, Dan, I thought it was a brilliant quote, the EU should be um, US's counterpart and not counterweight. I think this is really interesting. And I think for EU and for, you, for Germany, um, this is something that, um, we should absolutely focus on whatever the outcome is, because uh, I, I I believe that's absolutely true. We need to, as a EU, we need to solidify ourselves and we need to pull our weight when it comes to a lot of issues uh, at the global level. So on that note, because you didn't come here to listen to me, I just want to thank everybody um, for participating. Um, at, um, Ambassador John Emerson and, 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 and Van Halton, absolutely thank you so much for participating. And I want to give a shout out to, to SAIS as, as a fellow alumni. Um, and uh, also I'd like to thank Tina Hoffinghoff for absolutely uh, moderating this brilliantly. Thank you so much. A reminder that uh, Tina is a founder of the Transatlantic Hub, which is based in Munich. Um, and um, which uh, focuses very much on bringing um, people together and collaborating on transatlantic um, um, topics, which is very exciting. And if you want to you know, learn more about it, you can find more information on the Transatlantic Hub on, on the website. And then lastly, but not least, I'd like to thank the Aspen Institute for um, allowing um, um, me as a SAIS alumni representative of Germany and Tina from Transatlantic Hub to join the session, which is, as you may know, part of um, their uh, Road to Election events. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mildner, and also behind the scenes, Emily Schreier and Julian Metz. Thank you for, for helping us in organizing the whole event. And as I said, it's all been part of this Road of Election event, which is running from the Aspen Institute till 2025, so January 2025. So there's a lot of work being done on the elections and analysis and stuff. And so you can you can find out more on, um, on, on their events. And they have the next event on the 17th of September um, already. Um, so yeah, so that's it. And and the other thing I have to I have to thank you all participants. Uh, firstly, for for signing up, for participating, for taking the time, and for your great questions. So that's it. Um, it was a great event, and I wish you all a great evening. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.